Okay, so uh, today I'll talk about working memory. Um, working memory is like your mental workspace, and it's really well studied, of course, in part because the capacity is strongly related to intelligence. And if you've heard anything about working memory and working memory capacity, you've probably heard the basic story that um, when you're presented with, say, six things, you can't hold them all in mind, that you can only hold in mind something like three or four items. and. This is a super appealing and widespread view. Um, I think it's partly very appealing because it's based on a sort of intuitive mental model of physical objects. That is, it treats memories as though they're like discrete objects we can grab and hold, like you're literally holding those three items. Um, and that's really appealing. Um, by contrast, I think the right way to think about memory um, in terms of like population codes and signal to noise ratios um, are hard to think about. Um, they're hard to think about by comparison to a really intuitive physical model. Um, you know, four month olds have this phys intuitive physical model, um, whereas thinking about population codes and noise is hard um, and difficult. But I'll try to convince you that that's the right way to think. So to start, let's talk about the task that I'll talk about today. So um, remember these five colors as best you can. And then after some delay, I'll probe you on one location, in this case, the top one. And your job is to say what color you saw and click, or I'll click for you uh, where that was. Um, and this task has been really well studied. This is just a psychophysical continuous adjustment task. Um, and the data you get out of asking people to remember five colors looks something like this. You'll find something like lots of errors near zero. Those are accurate responses, right? Zero is good. Um, and then this really long, fat tail of errors. Um, and a lot of people have argued that this has actually a two component situation that these are guesses that this uniform distribution arises from people not knowing anything and clicking at a random spot on the wheel and that these clustered responses near zero are remembered items that vary in precision so the standard deviation changes sometimes and this is an incredibly prevalent view um, and it's really just a formalization of this holding in mind three items thing right like you're guessed on two of the items this view is so prevalent there's hundreds of papers that argue that you can distinguish changes in precision from the number of represented items. People use this to argue that consciousness is discrete, um, that iconic memory, working memory, long-term memory, the relationship of working memory to intelligence, all of these areas rely on this uh, exact model, hundreds of papers. Um, and what I want to argue is that it's completely wrong, <laughs> that uh, in fact that really all we have to do to understand those memory errors is think about just basic boring signal detection theory adding one component this psychophysical similarity scaling and i'll try to explain how this works okay so first let's think about signal detection theory as applied to a simple memory situation so imagine you saw this purple color and then afterwards you were asked which of these two things did you see purple or green the way signal detection theory conceptualizes this is that this green one that you never saw nonetheless evokes some familiarity in your mind. So on some trials, um, it might feel not that familiar, but on some trials, green might feel very familiar. And this purple color, because you did see it, the memory signal is that your familiarity, your memory match signal for that got boosted. So you got a two standard deviation boost, so your D prime is two. And so that means on average, purple feels more familiar than green, and on many trials it will, but sometimes it won't. That's the noise, right? So there's noise trial to trial. And this is basically how signal detection applies to memory. The whole insight that we are going to say explains all of the memory errors and all of those papers is just to consider what happens when you have a four alternative force choice instead. It's a really simple scale up, right? Imagine I showed you this purple and then asked which of these four things did you see? What I just said is that purple, the one you actually did see, gets a big boost in familiarity and that green color doesn't get any boost in familiarity. That's, that's what's depicted here. Of course, this dark green still probably wouldn't get any boost in familiarity. It's just another thing that is very different from what you saw. And so it would have a similar distribution centered on zero. And the question is sort of what about this dark purple? And if your intuition is that of course people would be more likely to pick that dark purple color than the green colors, because it's similar to the one they did see, then what you're thinking is that there's a boost in familiarity for this dark purple, even though it's not the color you saw, there's gonna be some boost for that. And so consequently the distribution for dark purple is gonna be shifted upward as well. Familiarity is going to have spread to that one too. And so that one might feel the most familiar on some trials or less on other trials, but it's going to feel on average more familiar than these other ones. If you wanted to scale this up to thinking about that continuous report task, you can just think of this as a 360 alternative force choice. And now the question is just how much boost in familiarity does each color get? If you saw purple, what does this function look like? And in fact, it seems to look something like this. This is effectively the function of how much boost in familiarity you get from having seen this purple color for all the other colors on the wheel. And so 
in this case, we just use it. We just measure this empirically in a totally separate set of subjects in a perceptual task. We just measure similarity, basically. I'll talk about it a little bit more later. But this is just a perceptual judgment of this color wheel, nothing to do with memory at all. This is just how far familiarity spreads in this color wheel as indexed by similarity. And so what this means is that our model of this 360 alternative force choice looks kind of like this, it's a little overwhelming, but effectively purple got boosted by two standard deviations um, because it's the color you saw. The greens didn't get boosted at all, but in between those colors got boosted sort of corresponding to how much familiarity tends to spread to them. So on trial one, you might feel really confident that purple was the color you saw. On trial two, you might feel like maybe it was green, but you're not totally sure. That was because there's noise in this process. And so it turns out this model, just saying there's a fixed similarity function and then signal detection, just noise, seems to account for all the memory distributions that we've ever found. That is when D prime is zero, none of the items get boosted. So you get what looks like random responses. When D prime is one, well, now you've boosted the target color and very similar colors a little bit, but you haven't boosted them so much that all those other colors that are centered at zero couldn't win. In fact, they win sometimes. And so you get this long tail. And when D prime is three, now you've boosted the target so much that only similar colors that got big boosts themselves have a chance of winning. And so you get these characteristic distributions that look just like those distributions in memory. And our claim is that this is the only way memory ever changes. There are not two parameters or three parameters that explain the shapes of the memory distributions. It's just one knob that changes all, and all changes always look like this. And that's true. That's true in now 40 different experiments we've run to show this. So um, blue here is the model fit and gray is the data from a bunch of people. Um, set size one, three, six, eight. You can see that it just looks like decreasing signal to noise, just D prime dropping. If you change the delay, then D prime drops at all the set sizes. If you increase the encoding time, Instead, D prime increases. So these all seem to change the signal to noise ratio, but none of them result in any qualitative changes in the shape of those distributions. That's awfully coincidental if there's really three ways these distributions can change shape, right? Um, why would they only need one parameter to change the shape according to this? And this isn't about color. Here's the similarity function for oriented gratings. Here it is for, for continuous face space. And here's the corresponding memory fits. Again, basically this, measuring this similarity function seems to work perfectly. Okay, so the idea is just this similarity scaling, just combined with just noise, just signal detection, seems to explain memory errors in all of these tasks in a fundamentally different way than that sort of guessing only a few items model. And so the question is really, where does this similarity scaling come from? Because the signal detection part's pretty straightforward. It's just signal detection. And for all the distributions, you can see these, these sort of look similar in some way. They're different shapes to some extent, but they look similar. And they're always roughly exponential. And this is exactly what we should have expected, right? That's because there's a huge amount of work showing both similarity and generalization are sort of approximately exponential with distance in psychologically uniform spaces like this LAB color space. Um, for example, the universal law of generalization or the GCM model, any number of, of things have shown that. Also, because we're at neural match, I'll point out that this is highly consistent with what you'd expect from population coding models. That is the overlap in neural codes, um, say in color channels, also predicts this sort of fall off, right? If you had neurons that sort of tiled color space, then the, the neurons activated by purple overlap quite a bit with nearby neurons, but they don't overlap with yellow or orange or red at all. So there's going to be a fall off. There's going to be an exponential function. In fact, it turns out that you can be pretty precise about this. You can just take a model visual system. In this case, uh, ResNet 18 we'll use as our model visual system and read out the top layer of it. We can feed in a bunch of colors and get uh, features from those colors and then compute similarity across the color space in this you know, toy visual system. And what you find is that the cosine similarity of colors as a distance on the color wheel looks almost exactly like the human similarity that we're using in our model. So this is, I think, further proof that this is really just a perceptual function. We're not measuring anything about memory. This function just is um, the color circle and how similar colors are on that color circle. The same thing works for faces. So here's the convolutional neural nets cosine similarity for this face space on top of the similarity for faces. So really, this is just a perceptual function that's fixed across all people and all conditions. And all we have to do is take that fixed function and add noise to it to explain memory errors. Okay. Let me just give one last bit here about two, two little simple predictions this makes that are, uh, I think, pretty cool. So one is that the usual models, variable precision or otherwise, predict a really qualitative thing 
that heterogeneity between items explains this fat tail. That is that the responses out here are caused by items that are not represented or are really poorly represented. And so measuring anything about these items won't tell you anything about the precision of the remembered items, right? Remember, knowing how often people guess is not going to tell you how precise their memories for individual items are. And so that means if we give people, say, a really easy force choice, like 180 degrees apart, did you see purple or green? These models predict that we're only measuring something like guess rate. We're not measuring the precision of the remembered items. You would never have an imprecise enough memory to make this error. By contrast, this model that we call TCC says that it, once you've measured D prime, you've measured how much boost purple got relative to a completely far away color, you know everything there is to know. You've already measured all of this, right? So that means if you then asked, okay, what happens if you gave someone an eight alternative force choice? All you do is plug in these normal distributions. You know where they are because of the similarity function. And you can predict exactly what the eight AFC error distribution should look like or what continuous report should look like. And that's what we find. So if you do two AFC, just how, you know, which of these two colors was it and calculate D prime, you can just plug that into this model and exactly predict how well what errors will look like for an eight alternative force choice, or even for a complete continuous report distribution. So this is a zero free parameter fit to this based only on how well people can do two AFC here. And that works even at an individual subject level. Okay, one last bit, which is that um, variability between items is really, I think, crucial to why people think there are only three items in their head. So here's a beautiful data from Kirsten Adam um, about where people are asked to report all six items in whatever order they want. So they see six colors, then they report all six items. This is the first one they report. This is the last one they report. And you can see when you look at this, the last three things they report look almost just like random guessing. And they say, look, that means people are only remembering three things. I want to just show you how this alternative way of thinking works. Imagine we had these six items and they were all encoded exactly the same as each other. We encoded all of them exactly equally. We got the same D prime boost for all of them. We corrupted it by the same amount of noise so that these were our memory er distributions. This is what our memories looked like for those six items. Now we first report the item that has the strongest signal. And then we work our way down until the sixth item we report, we're really not sure what color it was, but you know we think maybe it was one of these six colors. So we just go in order. All, ultimately, all items encoded exactly the same. Here's what that predicts down here. This predicts, this is all items encoded exactly the same, but just reporting them in confidence order. You'll see it's not perfectly uniform over here. If you add just a tiny amount of, amount of variability between items, you can make it match their data perfectly. Certainly nothing like three items unrepresented. Maybe it's un, unreasonable to assume that, you know, all the items are represented identically. So this is just a flavor of how this way of thinking works. Okay, so this model argues that noisy decision-making where memories differ only in memory strength is what explains errors with no separate concept of how many items are represented or precision, instead this noisy channel view. And the structure of the response distribution comes from noise plus the fixed stimulus simul similarity function. Um, and this accounts for memory as a function of set size, encoding time and delay, it allows generalization across tasks and stimulus space, accounts for ROCs, confidence reports, measures of variable precision, long-term memory, and lots more. Um, and so thanks to my co-authors in this paper and my family, um, especially my wife for watching like, both kids right now. Um, and uh, here's where you can go if you want more. Thanks. All right, Tim, that was really a fantastic talk and a, a tremendous amount of work. So great job. <laughs> uh, we've got a question in the uh, question section. It's quite long. Uh, so I'm going to read it out for you. Uh, oh, I the... can read it myself. Oh, you can read it. Perfect. Then you can read it. <laughs> <laughs> you read it. Read it out. Um, uh, so that, read I it will. out, please, though, so that way it's on the recording. Okay. So the um, question here is um, about some stuff from the Bayes lab with uh, Schneegans and Bayes about um, sort of population code models. So I had a brief citation up to them um, where they think about this in terms of population codes, um, and so the question is, presumably, you could think about the same kind of thing for spatial memory and use this in your model um, to account for, say, swaps and things. So um, we don't do that in part because we don't ever find any swaps ever. Um, so we don't find people swap locations. That's because we use relatively long encoding times and leave placeholders up on the screen. So in my mind, the location swaps are sort of um, something that 
you can make happen if you introduce lots of location uncertainty, but you can also eliminate them. And it doesn't change anything about the color capacity limits. Um, so I have not been super interested in them. Um, but yeah, we do have uh, some work going where we're trying to measure the same thing for location. Conceivably, if you measured location uncertainty, you could have a sort of zero parameter model that predicts swaps too, right? You'd have location uncertainty and color uncertainty. This is also a lot like the lin and over our um, interference model. So there's some combination of all of these things. I think there's actually quite a lot of convergence between the people who are thinking about the population code versions of this. This is of course really just really boring signal detection, but you can frame it in population code terms. Um, so yeah, I think there's all sorts of convergence between all of those ideas and it's a cool direction.